So my name is Rachel from Bats Without Borders and I'm delighted to welcome you to our 13th webinar. Today we have Dr. Tanya Straka, Professor Kigga Kingston, Dr. Joanna Coleman and Dr. Ewan McDonald joining us and I'm just going to invite them to introduce themselves. Thank you. Hello, I'm Tanja Straka. I'm a postdoc at the Technische Universität in Berlin. I was mostly studying urban bats in the recent years, but especially since my PhD, I was getting more and more interested in the human dimension approach of bat conservation. This is why what we are talking about today. Hello, I'm Tigger Kingston. I'm a professor um, at Texas Tech University in the US. I've been studying the ecology and conservation of bats, particularly in the old world for, for quite a while now, mostly in Southeast Asia, but also as you can see from my smiley face with an eidolon here, a little bit um, in Africa. Um, I'm also co-chair for the bat specialist group with responsibility for the old world and it's really uh, a consideration of the human aspects involved in bat conservation that have brought me more professionally interested in this field. Hi, I'm Joanna Coleman. I'm a senior lecturer at National University of Singapore and I'm an urban ecologist and I guess my research looks at the biotic impacts of urbanization and then the relationship between urbanization and the human nature relationship. And finally, ecosystem services rendered by urban wildlife. And mostly my study subjects are bats, well, bats and people. Thank you. So um, yeah, my name is Ewan McDonald and um, I'm a researcher at Oxford University's Said Business School. And you might think that a business school is a slightly odd place for a conservation researcher to end up but um, my research at the moment focuses on how we can take lessons from the world of marketing in particular and apply them to for the benefit of wildlife conservation problems and that's what's brought me largely into this realm of human dimensions of conservation. Um, I don't have any particular specialism in bats, I have to admit. I, my um, study taxa range from the very big to the very small, but um, I've really enjoyed working with this group of authors on this, um, on this topic and I've learned a hell of a lot while doing so. So I'm very, I'm actually really happy to talk about, about this topic because the four of us, as already mentioned a little bit at the beginning, we are all very passionate about this topic, about the human dimensions of bat conservation. And what does it mean? It means broadly to use social science research to study people with the aim to promote more effective bat conservation outcomes. And Tiga, Yuan, and Joanna and I were working on a systematic literature review that was addressing this topic. So first of all, why should we study people when, you, when we want to do more effective bat conservation? So as we all know, human bat interactions are very diverse. They range from positive to neutral. For instance, some people really enjoy seeing bats flying out. Every year, thousands of tourists come to us in Texas and see at night the Mexican free tail bats emerge. Fascinating, what a spectacle for some people. But others, as we are all aware as well, a lot, I'm sure, there are also a lot of conflicts between humans and bats. For instance, conflict between fruit farmers and bats, and also especially in recent times, the ongoing discussion about the risk of zoonotic diseases that come from bats. So these interactions between humans and bats are very diverse and people experience them of course also very differently because as we also know people are very complex beings in our relationship especially with non-human beings and as Hal Herzog the psychologist has already said there are some animals we love some animals we hate some animals we even eat and the same relates to bats but for some people, it might look delicious to have a plate full of bats. For others, it might be disgusting and they would rather groom a little bat park. So we are all very different when it comes to our relationship with bats. And there are, of course, also these all in, um, different interactions that are out there. 
So again, the question, why should we study people? Why should we study our complex human being when it comes to bat conservation? And when we look at the next slide, I think it becomes clear why we have to understand our own species when it comes to bat conservation. Because when we look at the figure, this was from a publication that was published last year, and it shows the major threats to bats. And they range from logging to agriculture to hunting, urban development, energy production and mining. And as we can all see here, they are all anthropogenic activities. They are all the consequences, they are human behaviors. So we could say here that the major consequences the major threat to people, uh, sorry, the major threat to bats um, is based on human behavior. And if we want to have a change here, we have to work, of course, with people and also understand this behavior, where it comes from, and maybe even how to change this behavior. And understanding people for conservation is, of course, not a very new endeavor. Already the famous Aldo Leopold was talking about how important it is to include people when we want to do effective conservation and how we have to work with people and understand them. And also some of the groundwork was done by the anthropologist Michael Manfredo and his group in Colorado. They were working a lot on the human dimensions of wildlife conservation and the importance to understand people when it comes to successful wildlife management and con conservation. And also in recent years, and I'm sure you are all aware of this, there is this, this rising field of research called conservation social sciences. And in this research field come together social scientists, but also natural scientists, and they, they aim to approach conservation also from the human perspective approach. They want to understand and integrate human dimensions to improve conservation and get an understanding. Why do people behave as they do? What are the underlying drivers? But these authors have already mentioned as well that it's not a very easy endeavor because, of course, social scientists and natural scientists, they have very different language. It's, it's a bit of a challenge and well. And the question is, of course, what really matters when it comes to human behavior? And we know it's their thoughts, such as their values, their norms, their attitudes, their beliefs but also their feelings, how they feel about something, if they feel fear or try or disgust about something. This all influences also how to behave towards an animal. And there are a lot of different theories out there from the social psychology hierarchy, and they address some of these concepts and bring them together in a certain frame, framework. And that's also something that Tiga will talk a bit later about. Now, very briefly again about the four of us, so, so the four of us, Tiga, Joanna, you and myself, we were already thinking a bit independently about this, about this topic. How can we include people in effective conservation? And we had, we had already different work, like whether we worked with different animals or we supervised students. And I'm sure you are all very familiar with the chapter that Tika wrote about the cute, creepy, crispy, and how values, attitudes, and norms shape human behavior towards pets. So we were all thinking a bit independently about this issue, about this topic. And last year we met at the International Bat Research Conference and we came together and thought, hmm, actually, to what extent has already the conservation social sciences been applied in the literature when it comes to bat conservation? And when we discussed this, this was one of the, this was the start when we thought, hey, we should do a systematic literature review on human bat interaction and see what's already out there. What do we know already out there and what theories and concepts have been there already applied? And what we did, so first of all, we started, of course, with a search in Web of Science and we used certain keywords such as bats or chiroptera and included different concepts such as values, attitudes and emotions. And then we applied different filters such as looking at the titles and abstracts, but also we reviewed the complete text in our filter too. And then we extracted the data and how we did it, and how we did it was two, two of us reviewed one paper. They extracted 30 plus criteria out from these papers, entered this in the table, and then we looked what's similar, what's dissimilar, and then we discussed it and found alignment. And in this process, we also took into account some of the criteria that social scientists see when natural scientists do this kind of research. 
for instance, um, this year a paper came out from Martin and she talked about the four common problems in environmental social research when it's undertaken by natural, so natural scientists. So these were also the criteria we took into account in our review. And we ended up with 63 papers from 40 journals and we categorized them. We also categorized them whether they were written only by social scientists or whether they were written by authors from different multidisciplinary backgrounds and then whether with the social scientists or without a social scientist to see do the papers actually change if these papers um, are written together with one or two social scientists. And it was a huge learning curve for us um, over this time when we worked together. So we had a lot of deep thoughts, a lot of self-reflection when we realized, oh, what have we done before in our work? Like huge learning curves, and lots of enlightenment. So it was a very, um, we had a lot of stimulating discussions over this time. And, but at the end, we came up now with 10 recommendations, which we would like to share with you. So, and we were splitting up these 10 recommendations in five recommendations that we thought could be considered as the roots, like as the groundwork, if we want to include social sciences to do human dimensions of batteries, bat, battery, bat conservation research. And if these roots are grounded and strong, then the tree can grow into five different leaves where we thought this could be the direction in which the research field the human dimensions of bat conservation could move forward. And I stop now here and I hand over to Tega. So thank you for that introduction there, Tanya. And the first and well, all of our roots are very important for the growth of the tree. But the first one that we really want to emphasize is the need to embed the study that you're undertaking in a conceptual framework. Where did this this come from? Well, in part, it comes from our own personal journeys and my journey into human dimensions began with that chapter that um, that Tanya highlighted earlier, the cute, creepy and crispy chapter. And in, originally, this was going to be a study of um, outreach and environmental education, because like many of us, I have done a fair number of activities like that, where I visited schools or local communities or developed materials, put on workshops. But largely, these have focused on, on knowledge sharing. They've been telling people how diverse bats are, how important bats are, how threatened bats are, um, with the intent that this will change people's hearts and minds and they will go forth and love and conserve bats from here on out. Um, and this is very appealing, but I then began to reflect, well, does this really change hearts and minds and what, what does influence how people feel, think, and critically, how do people act? How the people's what drives people's conservation relevant behaviors towards bats so this led me to a kind of two-year journey into the literature to find of course that there was an entire discipline of human dimensions so perhaps we should have read that or i personally should have read that a little bit earlier and then this new burgeoning field of conservation psychology and both were formulating and drawing in concepts and frame and conceptual frameworks from psychology, from human dimensions that really, and what these conceptual frameworks do is they take these key constructs about the influences of human behavior, such as attitudes, social norms, um, uh, whether you feel you can perform a behavior, what your values are, and they put these into a causal framework a hypothesis whereby we can understand the relationship between somebody's values, how that influences their perceptions, their attitudes, and how that all knocks on to influence the behavior. This is for natural scientists. Now, this starts to make sense. This is very much a, hypo a, a hypothesis framework, and it, of course, strengthens the inference that you can make about the context that you're studying and that is critical for underpinning uh, any recommendations that are going to be forthcoming. So we wanted to see those two, thing, two things. Did people know what concepts they were studying about the people and were they clearly 
defined or was it just a throwaway we studied attitudes or was it well this is this aspect of attitudes or the attitudes as defined by this person so we wanted to see to what extent the concept was um, clearly defined and explained and whether the concepts were embedded in a causal or conceptual framework yeah. Now, unfortunately, very few papers did a good job of defining concepts in their literature review. Typically, what we tend to do is wax lyrical about the bats, the conservation context, um, and, but very little about the concept or the, um, the concept of interest. And when it came to framing and the conceptual framework, only 13 of 63 studies fully and explicitly embedded their work in a conceptual framework. Now, we've given, as we go yeah, through our slides we we're giving highlighting some papers that we found um did things well and one of my favorites was by reed in 2016 and they used the theory of planned behavior to evaluate the relative influence of attitudes norms and perceived behavioral control in shaping farmers intent to kill bats as a rabies mitigation measure in costa rica So the second route on our recommendation tree relates to a lesson I learned. So not from my natural science training, but from my current work with an interdisciplinary environmental studies program. So one big part of my job involves taking students to the Philippines and guiding them as they use ecological and social science methods to evaluate community-based conservation initiatives. And then another is supervising environmental studies honors students, many of whom want their project to incorporate some human geography. And that's actually how I got really interested in human nature relationships and came to see that they're way too complex to explain by numbers alone, meaning quantitative surveys. So even though quantitative surveys are fast and easy and good if you want to broadly compare predictive factors in large samples, um, they don't meet certain other goals like deeply understanding social phenomena. Also, they're not powerful when sample sizes are small and they do poorly at elucidating the how of these interactions, meaning where do these attitudes, norms and behaviors come from? And yet 60% of the studies we reviewed were purely quantitative. Now at first, we thought it might be because most of the authors in our data set were natural scientists, as Ewan will explain. Um, and actually, this was one of Martin's main critiques, this tendency for natural scientists to rely on quantitative methods alone. But then three quarters of the 31 papers whose authors included at least one social scientist were also purely quantitative. And so it looks like our review reveals a lot of missed opportunities to present a holistic picture of the human dimensions of bat conservation. Hence, our suggestion that future work explore more of the approaches in the social science toolbox because surely some of them are better at asking the big questions and are more contextually appropriate. So which methods? Well, participatory approaches like Delphi method seem useful given how important equity and participation are to conservation decision making. And then there are spatial techniques, which let researchers meaningfully combine social and ecological data. Now, the one exception in our data set was a study that used spatial methods to understand how Ghanaians understand the zoonotic risk of disease from bats. But we were most surprised that only tree studies used mixed methods. And I say surprised because with mixed methods, you get the power of stories and numbers. 
Um, and by mixed methods, we mean studies that purposefully integrate qualitative and quantitative sampling so that one informs the other. Now, one study that did this well is the same one Tiga just mentioned, focusing on how the conflict between livestock owners and vampire bats was leading to just indiscriminate killing of bats. And in that case, Reed used mixed methods to ID the most useful foundations for conservation education. So me again, I'm talking about the follow best social science practices. So as ecologists and conservationists, conser conservationists, we know of course that well done research also yields high quality data. And the same relates of course to social sciences. And in worst case scenario, the data might be not useful or might be misleading or only applies to a certain population if we don't do it well. So Martin pointed out a few of the best social science practices, which we also included in our review. And we actually, we had kind of to agree with her that there were a lot of um, best practices not followed. And, but the good news is, of course, there is a wealth of literature out there that talks about these best practices and how we can learn them. And we can study them by ourselves or in other cases also include social scientists in our research. And it depends, of course, what kind of social science research you do and which methods you want to apply, whether you do quantitative, as Joanna mentioned before, or qualitative studies. But one thing have all these methods in common, or these approaches in common, they all benefit from pilot studies. And pilot studies are actually quite interesting and so it seems so important, especially for the social sciences, because with social sciences, you can get, for instance, an understanding about the length of your questionnaire or your interview. Also, if your language is clear, if your participants actually understand what you want to ask them or to, what you want to have from them. Or also, you might discover that actually maybe, maybe an interview is better than just doing a survey. So pilot studies really help. And especially, we discuss this also a lot when you apply concepts that were developed in Western cultures and you want to apply them into non-Western cultures. How, um, you, how, how would you do it if you don't test them and you don't know that they apply? So pilot studies. One of the papers we highlighted here was one of Prokop. And he developed items to measure attitudes towards bats. And he did not only test these items with zoology professors or biology education experts, he also tested them in addition with 60 students because before he was sending them out. And it's actually one of the most cited papers, or uh, was one of the most cited, cited papers in our review. And I'm also talking about our route number four, which is about generate actionable recommendations that are grounded in the results. So conservation is a practical discipline. And as conservationists, we want to make, of course, our work count that maybe practitioner can make use of it or that, that we just know what to do with it. And while, of course, academic interest is, is, has its own justification to just know what we did and what, what the outcomes were, we were quite surprised that only 17 of our 63 papers provided recommendations that were really grounded in the results, that really took the results and were building recommendations on it. And for instance, how to improve education measures, or if we want to know how to really mitigate a conflict, what can we do now? Or what could be the next steps for our research? However, unfortunately, most of the papers were provided um, generic recommendations, which was more, um, we need to do more research, or we need to educate people. So, so we thought we want to encourage all of us actually, and us included, of course, like we want to um, generate actionable recommendations that are crowded in results to make our work count for bad conservation. And one of the examples that they did really well was a paper from Shrita and Murato from last year. And they told, for example, that if you include the human cause of endangerment of a species, it can improve your fundraising campaign. So 
Thank you. So before I tell you about our fifth recommendation, I wanted to very quickly introduce myself. My name's Ewan and while I work in a business school, I have what might be called a traditional conservation background in that I started out with a grounding in zoology and ecology. And in that regard, I think I'm probably pretty similar to most of you in the audience today. But in my career as a conservation scientist, I've become increasingly passionate about studying the human dimensions of conservation problems. But as a zoologist tackling social issues, I can clearly remember my first couple of studies where I naively thought I could just ask some people some questions when I was done in the field collecting my biological data. How hard can it be to just ask some questions? Well, as I learned the hard way, I think the answer is very hard. And to my shame, I'm an author on several papers out there that break many of our various recommendations. So just as we would scoff at an untrained economist or an anthropologist who turned up in our study site um, declaring loudly that they were going to conduct a rigorous population survey or study the genetic connectivity between two different populations, we as conservation scientists, we should have the humility to recognize that the social sciences are hard and that there are reams upon reams of study and background that we need to be aware of before jumping into a topic. So what did we find in this particular review? Um, well, firstly, we found that over 50% of the papers in our review were authored by teams of natural scientists. And unfortunately, but maybe a little bit predictably, these studies generally did a poor job of setting their work in the context of the existing literature or of building their research around a recognized and explicit conceptual framework. Secondly, around 10% of the papers in our review were authored by teams of social scientists. And generally, we found that these papers did an excellent job, um, but there were only a small number of them. So maybe, it just, maybe that suggests that conservation issues may just not be that interesting to social scientists, or perhaps they don't know where to start. Um, we're not sure. But finally, around 40% of the papers in our review were authored by multidisciplinary teams involving a combination of both social and natural scientists. And we were really excited and optimistic about these because we hoped that they would deliver the best of both possible worlds. But sadly, we were a little bit disappointed. Um, the multidisciplinary teams in our review barely performed any better than the natural scientists did alone. And we think that this is because most of the interdisciplinary teams that we looked at included only one or just a few social scientists working alongside a large group of natural scientists. So maybe they were brought, alongside, brought on board late in the process, or maybe their voices were drowned out. We're not sure, but we were disappointed by the comparatively poor performance of these interdisciplinary projects. So maybe we should conclude that interdisciplinarity is dead, right? Maybe we should just leave the social sciences to the social scientists and we should just stick to counting our bats. Well, no, I don't think that's quite what we, we think. Um, we don't see our results as a failure of this interdisciplinarity, but rather just a sign that it's hard very hard to bring people together from different backgrounds and with different objectives to deliver a truly good paper. And so this recommendation is all about calling us to do better. Bring social scientists into your project from an early stage, listen to them with openness and curiosity, and build and develop your study together, rather than just tacking the social science questions on at the end. Truly collaborative work is very, very hard, but at the end of the day, we feel that it will yield the best possible results if done properly. Right, so, so now we 
have established our, our core roots, the ones we felt were most vital for the growth of our tree. But how are we going to expand and grow our tree? Well, this is the first of our five recommendations. Uh, and let's start by looking at the graphic that we're presenting here. It's, it's kind of merges two measures, but if you look at the X axis, which is set at zero, as all good X axes should be, um, <clears throat> and projecting down in the green, red, and gray is species richness for each of the regions as defined by the IUCM in its red list assessments. And we've also indicated the number of threatened and data deficient taxa in the red and gray respectively. Um, if you then look up from the X axis, we have the number of authors from each region in the pale brown and the number of studies conducted in those regions. So take a minute to digest that. But what we're finding is that, as we all know, species richness peaks in the tropics. And in this, this um, organization, we see large numbers of species in the regions captured here as South and Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and then Central and South America. These are also the regions that are facing significant threats to bat diversity. We've got extensive habitat loss, uh, hunting in a lot of the old world, persecution, increasing conflict over, for example, fruit crops, and now, of course, concerns about disease emergence in some of the most species-rich areas of the world. So that is the situation, but now let's look at where our studies are from um, and where they're being conducted and who's conducting them. Well over half of our authors were from North America and Europe and Australia, which is embedded in the Oceania group. So these are regions with many researchers and many studies that is greatly disproportionate from the number of bat species that are actually within those regions. So with the caveat that, that there could be studies that have been published in other languages, because our research, our review only focused on English publications, it's very obvious that there's an enormous potential and great need for, for research in the bat diversity hotspots of the world. Most notably in this is the tropical Americas, so the Central and South America uh, regions, where there's almost nothing um, um, out there. Um, and in the other tropical hotspots, so you'll see that there seems to be quite a lot going on in sub-Saharan Africa, but a deeper dive into that would highlight the fact that a lot of that is con concerned with disease emergence and not to do with other issues that may be pertinent to bat conservation. <clears throat> so we also don't just want in North American, European and Australians conducting the research in these regions. So there's, it's key that we see an increase and in an enhancement of in-region or in-country capacity uh, to, to undertake some of these studies. And in many countries, at least some being my personal experience, that there are already many social scientists out there conducting rigorous social science. And so perhaps the shortcut to expanding research in these areas is to start integrating in-region social scientists into conservation issues, get their expertise, get their help. You have the expertise for framing questions. What is it we need to know? What is the conflict situation? But drawing in and capitalizing on that social science expertise that exists is, would help fast track um, and fill some of these gaps. Okay, so our next recommendation in the tree canopy addresses the diversity of human stakeholders in human bat interactions. So agricultural producers, animal rights advocates, guano collectors, conservation managers, people who feel spiritually connected to bats, people who eat bats, and future generations. These are just some of the affected agents and they all must have their views recognized. On the bright side, by far most papers, 58 in fact, were embedded in context, meaning they addressed the research question in the appropriate target group as opposed to, for instance, trying to understand the conflict between livestock owners and vampire bats while sampling all farmers or worse, the general public. So that's good. 
uh, less good is the fact that only seven papers investigated more than one group of stakeholders. The rest had single target groups. To us, that's a problem. Because I mean, decades of research show that involving diverse stakeholders yields better results from conservation initiatives that range from captive breeding to protected areas. And we stress the ethical and practical need to study vulnerable and or marginalized groups, since they're the ones who usually get the least say in conservation decisions, while also being the ones who are most affected by the conservation problems and their solutions. So if conservation social science sprouts from a recognition that effective conservation tends the human dimension, well then, logically, researchers should study the whole range of people involved in these issues. So it's no wonder that this principle is the foundation of stakeholder mapping, which is step one in systematic conservation planning. Besides, without our adequate participation, it's tough, maybe even impossible, to bridge the research action gap. And that's why we urge future researchers to duly consider diverse stakeholders. Now, one paper in our review stood out for consulting farmers, plantation workers, horticulturalists, orchard owners, and forest managers to gauge perceptions of ecosystem services rendered by fruit bats in Kerala, India. And again, that same study of ranchers killing bats in Costa Rica did a great job carefully choosing appropriate stakeholders. So me again, and I think that my co-authors asked me to speak about this topic because it's one that I've struggled with myself many, many times in my own research. And so maybe if I'm on record talking about it in public, then it'll force me to do better in the future. So this recommendation is to look beyond attitudes and remember why we're all here. As committed conservationists, we know that unless people change their behaviours, then the world is going to burn around us. Species are going to go extinct and we as modern humans are going to be responsible. Now, I've already told you that I'm a zoologist by background and I never want to lose the fundamental biology and ecology that underpins so much great conservation work. But in my view, it's no longer sufficient for conservation as a discipline to simply just count animals. People need to change their behaviours. And we as conservationists need to work with communities to find ways of facilitating and supporting these changes in a way that works for everyone. So how do we do it? Well, if the papers in our review are to be believed, then we do it by studying attitudes, which was the focus of 60% of the papers in our study. Do this, do this group of people like bats? Or do that group of people like bats? And that's all very fine and interesting. But the question that I want to ask you today is how does this information move us towards our end goal of behavior change? So there are many different conceptual models for behavior change. And one of my personal favorites is the reasoned action approach by Martin Fishbein and Ike Eisen, shown in the flowchart at the bottom of the slide here. And what you can see is that while attitudes are an important component of this model, an important component of influencing people's behavior, they're only a single constituent element alongside social norms and behavioral control. So in theory, studying attitudes should be fine, but almost none of the attitude studies in our review situated their research in the context of a behavioral problem framework that would justify anecdotes. So this slide is an appeal for us all to start with a focus on conservation. What is it that we want to achieve? Bats. If so, behavior is not currently taking place and the barriers to it taking place in the future. Is it because farmers think that net substitutes? Is it because farmers, the context through the lens of a valid conceptual framework, 
then and only then can we justify studying at ultimately conservation social science aims to understand what drives human behavior so that interventions are more effective right well then it should assess how well those interventions work but unfortunately these types of studies are rare in the literature on human wildlife interactions generally just like they were in our review i mean we did find seven observational studies that measured knowledge and or attitudes after some kind of intervention, but hardly any properly asked how those attributes changed as a result. And we specifically point out the need for two types of studies. So the first one is experimental. And here we're talking about rigorous studies with controls and treatment groups who receive the intervention in question. A classic example is the randomized control trial, and we found three studies that used it. They were all interested in message framing. Two of them asked how it affects people's receptivity to and support for public health and conservation goals. And a third one studied its impact on whether people would donate money to conservation, and if so, how much. Now, one design we didn't encounter, but that might be useful, is a modification of the before-after control impact or BASI design that many ecologists might know. Uh, so the acronym is the same, just the I stands for intervention. And it has been used, for instance, to show that while economic incentives don't get Brazilians in the Amazon to consume less wild meat, social marketing does. Now, the second type of study is longitudinal. So two of the papers we reviewed revisited questions asked in prior studies by other authors. So one measured how the perceived risk of rabies of cavers had changed, and the other studied how Americans' attitudes toward wildlife changed from 1978 to 2014. But we think this approach could go a long way toward determining the, determining the durability of the behavioral changes instigated by conservation interventions. So what does it all mean? Well, before we ask that, I do just want to comment that even though we are giving what seems like an overwhelming and exhausting list of things to do and highlighting all the things people have done wrong, this comes from um, a lot of self-reflection as, as Ewan has highlighted on our own missteps in this field. And we don't want this to put people off. We want this to empower you to move forward. So that, that's a very important message to convey. And, and we anticipate that this will be published and out there in the coming, well, I won't even say the coming what, but fairly soon. But it will be there as a guideline. So, so what does it all mean if we conclude? It is clear that there's a lot for us as a research community to do, um, but we could be doing it a lot better. We really do need to bring greater rigor to our research because without the conceptual frameworks, without following best practice during implementation, without strong roots, our inferences about the situation are going to be compromised. And this greatly constrains the use of any recommendations or action that can be taken to resolve the situation. This kind of work is the bedrock of conservation action, so it has to be solid. And lastly, there are many challenges to bat conservation. I'm sure those of you working, um, well, pretty much anybody working on bat, bat research, you encounter challenges that perhaps make you feel powerless. It's really hard to know what to do when you hear about entire forests or habitats being lost, land use change driven by policy or poverty or both. And that can make us feel very, very powerless is the only word I can think of and demoralized. But at the same time, the human bat interface is expanding. And because of COVID-19, the public awareness of 
the bat has never been greater. This is a pivotal time in the human bat relationship. And we as a community are uniquely positioned to study this relationship from both sides and work to ensure positive outcomes for bat conservation. So I, I close there with a message of inspiration and hope that people will engage in this challenge and, and move forward for bat conservation. Fantastic. Thank you very much um, to the team for a great talk and we'll be sure to publicise the paper when it comes out. So I have a, a few questions to kick off with, but just wanted to say if anybody wants to put more questions in the chat, please feel free to do so. Or else if you want to raise your hand, um, then I'll call your name and you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly. We realise everybody's working from home, so dogs playing with balls or kids asking questions in the background is fine. Um, and also just to let you know, um, so the webinar is scheduled to end um, shortly, but we'll carry on um, with the questions. And, and those of you who need to shoot off, that's fine. Um, and you can catch up uh, later. So if that's okay, we'll, we'll continue. So the first question is from Cara saying, do you think ecotourism in specific areas could be a viable strategy for conservation with bats as it has been with other animals? I think that ecotourism has the potential to be an enormously powerful tool for conservation in the appropriate contexts. And um, my own slightly pessimistic view, if I may air it, is that I think that the number of contexts where it is likely to have a meaningful Im impact is small. If you look at um, the impact that ecotourism has had for the protection of many other species around the world, the number of national parks in the world that turn a profit, let alone um, break even, it will break even, let alone turn a profit, is very, very small. And those parks are clustered in areas that are, are easy to access, are in sort of comfortable areas for people to visit. Um, people aren't going to um, find themselves holidaying on um, ecotourism safaris or whatever in in. Um, in certain areas, um, conflict torn or others, and I think that um, that the possibility for ecotourism to deliver wide scale benefits is small, and that the most important thing we need to look at is finding ways and incentives for local communities to live alongside in harmony with the wildlife that they have surrounding them. Um, ecotourism, ecotourism can be a part of that, but I think it can only be a, um, a small part of that. Bracken Cave in Texas, which attracts a lot of people to come and see the emergence of the Mexican free-tailed bats. And this is an activity that has generated, and Tiga can correct me if I'm wrong, but some um, sizable revenue for BCI as well as potentially other operators. And then I was thinking of Deer Cave in Sarawak, which is on the island of Borneo. And until the recent discovery of this massive cave in Vietnam, we thought it was the biggest bat cave in the world. And there's a tourist attraction, which is called um, the, the Flying Dragon. So people go there to see the emergence of many, many bats every night in Sarawak. And this is located in a major national park. And again, it's an activity that requires a guide and you must pay. And this generates revenue for the national park. So because you know, conservation without money is just conversation. I guess this revenue can help to uh, enforce the PA boundary <clears throat> in this national park. But those are really the two examples I could think of. I wasn't sure if there are any others. Yeah. Just as a comment, we've often um, kind of tossed this one around when we've been our regional group CB crew for Southeast Asian Bat Conservation Research Unit. 
Um, and and I think it tracks back to to Ewan's point that until bats are on the same level as an attractant as say the big five and. Africa, which we're a fair way off that happening. Bats can be a bolt-on or an add-on to some kind of existing tourist activity, but people aren't going to travel miles and um, go uh, greatly out of their way to see some of these events. But uh, I think places where it might work, and if, uh, if you're in an area that's already attracting eco-tourists, um, there's a, a cave in... Um, uh, in Langkawi, which is a geological uh, geopark in, in Peninsular Malaysia or just off the coast. Um, and people are visiting the park anyway, and they, then they go in a boat under a cave that is full of bats. And that has generated income for the local fishermen who are now using their boats for this. Now, this is where the trade-off comes, though, is that that's a substantial form of disturbance. So how to the bats? And now there are concerns about what the impact of eco this particular ecotourism is um, on the bats themselves. So uh, these things can be, there's, it's a field that's rife for greater exploration, but there are m many components to think about both economically and whether it's going to make sense um, and actually counter the opportunity cost for whatever that person would be doing in the first place versus um, also the, the impact on the, on, the, on the bats themselves. Thank you very much. Um, and then we have a great question from Helen saying, is there a possible element of resistance of participation by potential stakeholders rather than researchers not being inclusive? And I know um, Joanna had uh, some really good comments on this too. Um, and if anybody else wants to join in, please do. Um, so what I said was, the, the, so the question was a really good one because, you know, reading these studies, we can only read what's written there, what's reported. So it's, I guess it's always possible that the researchers did attempt to be more consultative than it appears. Um, that said, we never found any studies where the authors said that they tried to recruit participants from a given stakeholder group and failed to do so, which would be something I would report if I were writing up this type of study. Now, um, in my experience doing uh, evaluation of community-based conservation, I find that when we go in and we take the time to properly build rapport and we go in in a culturally appropriate manner. Actually, people seem to want to talk to us and oftentimes they express this desire to do so because they believe that somehow our research will lead to, for instance, a reduction in the problem of opportunity costs of establishing the conservation initiative in the first place or otherwise making their livelihoods better. But of course, my experience is, you know, um, in Singapore and Philippines only, and that's a pretty small geographic area. So it's difficult to generalize. Yeah. Maybe Ewan has something to say since he's done some of this, you know, um, work and Tanya as well and Tiga, I don't know. Yeah, I can, <clears throat> I can say something. And I think the answer is potentially yes. I think Joanna is completely right that, <clears throat> excuse me, many, many authors may omit that from writing up their papers, rightly or wrongly. But um, so we, so we weren't able to track it. But um, I think um, my response would um, lean towards some of the things that we talked about in our recommendations. And one of those the key ones is to diversify the group of people who are doing this research and asking these questions. Um, and that's from two, point, two standpoints. The first is the issue of engagement, um, just as you say, and, um, and if people are, if, if the researchers are continuously coming from foreign institutions and just dipping in and dipping out, that might reduce the level of engagement with those issues. But more importantly, I think, or not more importantly, I think just as importantly, it might, might also change 
the results that they're like the answers that they're likely to give you so um i was not so long ago involved in some studies of attitudes towards various elements of lion conservation in zimbabwe and we were working in very poor rural communities around um, Hwangi national park and um and we felt that it was important that all of the surveyors, all of the people who conducted the surveys and ran the, ran the studies were recruited from, um, recruited from the local communities so that they had um, local buy-in and um, many of the questions were developed with the local community as well. Um, and if I, as a European white male had wandered into the villages asking people what they thought about certain problems, the answers I think would have been very different. So um, getting honest and engaged answers, um, I think having a diverse pool of people asking the questions is really important for that. Okay, so we have a comment from um, Rena. She was just saying, um, just her opinion, not a question, but people will care a great deal more about bats once it is obvious that bats as a model organism is more potent than rodents and hold answers to aspects of human biology or disease, like neurobiology of aging, cancer resistance, um, etc. So I don't know if anybody wanted to comment on that. Well, I would agree that bats, we're getting greater and greater evidence of, of the potential that bats have to inform human health, especially with um, the work that's coming out of the Bat 1K initiative with the sequencing, um, providing highly well, well, well annotated full genomes for um, the goal is all, at least one bat. Spe well, it's all bat species, but right now they're kind of starting at let's get the family, then let's get the genus. But what we're learning from those studies um, has great influence or great potential to inform human health in the aspects that, that Alon talked about. The, and because these directly relate to human health, they may hold more power than some of our normal knowledge based uh, things that we try to convey, convey about bats being important for pollination, important for seed dispersal. Um, so there is potential there that, bats, that people may come to appreciate bats more because it's now moved that little bit closer to, to them, to people. The challenge still can be, though, that you can tell people, go, oh, that's really cool, that's really interesting, but I'm still going to eat them, right? And so where there's early literature on behavior change really went from knowledge should change the behavior like i tell you bats are an important pollinator therefore you're going to stop eating them but we now see with things like the theory of planned behavior which is what grew out of the um, reasoned action that um, you had highlighted is, is that really that attitude that knowledge is part of an attitude but that is only the one thing that may be driving somebody's behavior it may be great they're pollinators but i it's very important for me to feed my family all my friends are hunting, my wife wants me to hunt, I know where the bats are, so I'm really sorry, but I'm going to go and hunt. Right? So I think it has potential because it brings the issue closer to people, um, but it's, it's only a small part of understanding human behavior. And we need to be very careful about this link between knowledge and conservation relevant behaviors because it, it's not a straight line. Um, do you yeah, want to I... Okay, I'd say something after you no go ahead <laughs> you waited already so i just wanted to add as well so this was also one of the big questions i started off a little bit what information is interesting to people that they start to like bats and and um so i would also agree that this this might be an interesting information for people but but i remember when i came across the first time how people process information differently through their filter what's really important to them so a little bit what Tika said before, but I was coming a bit more from the filter that people have, how they process this information and how important it also is the messenger who provides this information. So, so it's not just the message we say, it's also the, the messenger who says it, how credible is the messenger and what are the resources. So, so these are all the things um, I just wanted to point out we can also take into account when we provide this information and um, now you and you can finally say. 
Yeah, no, I would, I would, I wouldn't contradict anything that either of my colleagues have said. I think they're completely right. Um, but I would like to say something because I think this question hints at how I got into this issue from the beginning. I mean, again, I, I in my naivety early on used to think, well, if only I could tell people how wonderful these animals are, they would come to love them just as much as I do. And unfortunately, I think for all the reasons that Tanya and Tigger have mentioned, that's just not the case. Um, one of the same Zimbabwe study I mentioned earlier, we were talking to people about um, human wildlife conflict and lions and so forth. But um, one of the things we seemed to find um, was an association um, between knowledge and liking but there was a but it was a perverse sort of um, association insofar as if you started from a position of liking an animal first a lion in this case say and you knew more about it that seemed to increase the level that you liked the animal however if you started from a position of disliking the animal to start with then more knowledge made you dislike it more um, and so I think that there are very few people in the world who know more about wolf ecology than Minnesotan sheep farmers and I think there are very few people who know more about the ecology of birds of prey than grouse farmers on the Scottish moors but that doesn't stop them hating them with a passion and so I think um, we need to think about both context and salience of information, those are two things that come very strongly in conservation and in, 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 strongly in the world of marketing. Um, but I think that just assuming that if people know more about the species we love so much, then they'll like them as much as we do. Um, I don't think that helps. And I think we need to work a lot harder at changing people's minds and hearts. Thank you very much. Um, and then we have a question from um, Alan, who's um, from the Philippines, and he's doing his master's in wildlife studies um, and looking particularly at flying foxes. And he's currently writing a proposal um, about the role and effectiveness of corporate social responsibility towards the conservation of megabats. So um, his question um, are, are there any recorded studies in, in other countries where corporate social responsibility has protected bats and their successful habitats and were these successful or not? And do you think that um, corporate social responsibility are genuinely effective in bat conservation? So, um, I mean, the right away when I saw that question, I thought about Bacardi which of course I think faced pressure to engage in CSR due to the use of an old world fruit bat as its logo. And so the company, among other things, donates large sums of money to BCI. And I guess BCI is, you know, the largest globally um, bat conservation NGO. Um, other than that, it does um, fund other conservation initiatives. That was the one example that I was sure um, exists. I don't think it's been studied though. And then I was wondering maybe if some of the tequila companies might also have CSR initiatives, but I'm really not sure. And maybe there are even, you know, major durian uh, producers, um, or agri-food companies that might have such measures, but this is just a guess. So as a conservationist who's accidentally found themselves working in a business school, I might have a slightly different take on this. And I can't speak particularly about the link between CSR and bats but I have been part of several interesting conversations in the business school about the role of um, CSR 
in terms of um, influencing business behavior in general. So just for everyone out there, just in quickly, um, just in case it's not clear, CSR is corporate social responsibility. And the idea is that if as a company, you can show that you have a strong social con conscience and you're doing good things for the world, that might enable you to leverage greater sales and greater profits for your own business. Um, and Alan, I think it's really interesting that you're looking at this um, from a conservation perspective. But one thing you might consider from a business school perspective is that many of the conversations I've had are shifting away from CSR as a model for driving behavior in businesses and moving towards what people are talking about as brand reputation. So rather than companies saying, hey, if we show that we're doing a good thing, people will like us more. Brands are worried about the bad reputation of doing a bad thing. So I don't know if this is a good analogy, but rather than a race to the front of showing how good companies can be, they're all involved in a race up from the bottom. They don't want to be the worst company and they don't want to be caught out doing bad things um, because they're worried that if they do so, um, then that'll have a big impact, a big negative impact on their reputation. And so that's a big issue that companies are involved in talking about. Now, another side to this, and I always get myself in trouble in a business school because I'm a bit of a black sheep there, is I lots of companies talk about purpose. And I have a very hard time with that. They, many companies say, we want to do good in the world. Um, and I'm fine with that, but they say, if you want, we want to do good in the world and that will allow us to make more money. Well, I think that if you're, it's all very well and good if you do something good and it allows you to make, make money, but I don't think that's a, a, a noble or a moral thing for you to be doing. You're just, just still doing it because you're making money. You're just coincidentally doing something that is good. I think that the real morality in business comes when you stop doing something that you shouldn't do, even if it would make you money, because it is the right thing to do. And my question to businesses out there um, is how often do they do that? How often when they have a product line or they have a business endeavor that they could embark on that would dem could demonstrably make them money, how often do they say, well, no, we won't do that because conservation is more important to us. And um, again, I don't want to be a pessimist, but I think my personal view is pretty bleak on that at the moment. Just adding on from that, I mean, do you think for a lot of the, the corporate social responsibility angle and business getting more involved is, I guess they, they set aside funds um, and it's actually more, I guess, researchers or, or conservation organizations who approach them with their their idea as opposed to specifically saying you know like maybe apart from maybe Bacardi but you know not necessarily looking at that conservation but they might be doing say for instance habitat restoration or like engaging in the voluntary carbon market and trying to offset their carbon emissions which might be tree planting or protection of wild areas um, so do you think it's kind of more a case of not necessarily a specific species in mind but more, I guess, people are, seem to be moving more towards habitat um, kind of protection. Well, yeah, so um, I think my last point ended, sounded a bit bleak and a bit, um, a bit down. And I, and I think you're completely right. Um, and I think that may be one of the advantages to a brand reputation approach rather than a corporate social responsibility approach. Because if you're taking a corporate social responsibility approach, as you say, you're setting money aside to do some good deeds that you publicize and everyone gets very excited and maybe that will help drive, help drive sales. A brand reputation approach, I think, covers many more bases in that you don't want to be seen to be having an unsustainable supply chain. You don't want to be seen to be um, breaching um, ethical, ethical labor market practices or employment practices. Um, and you don't want to be seen to have excess packaging through your thing. So, you're all, so 
you always have to be looking throughout your whole supply chain and your whole endeavor to be finding the weak link that you're that could be an eggshell for you to trip up on in the future if i mix my metaphors a little bit but um but yeah so i think um a, a brand reputation approach can can um yield what you're talking about which is a more diverse environmental approach to um, the whole operation of the business i think yeah no thank you very much i i totally <laughs> agree with you i think um yeah we've certainly um had quite a lot of bat conservation ngos we know have contacted bacardi and not even got a response so i think it might be um you know just sort of you know bigger companies as well that um that or ngos that that they're kind of engaging with um but we have um, two quick questions from Teresa. Um, given how many bats are classified as threatened, endangered, or data deficient, I was hoping you could comment on how social science may maybe help you fill in some of the important gaps that we know. For example, I know from my work in Namibia and the US, I've been able to find additional um, roosts from my interviews with local pastoralists. Um, another question, um, how have you gone about correcting misinformation from the interviews or surveys? Some of my respondents have mistaken birds or bats in describing bat behavior, firmly believed in regional myths um, about bats. For example, bats in northwestern Namibia are rumored to cut off people's ears um, with their wings. And that's the same in KwaZulu-Natal. I think bats can, can bite off your ears. <laughs> Um, so kind of a, in, in response to the second question, what's interesting is that the, um, so in, in Singapore, um, most of the population is ethnically Chinese. And actually, when my student asked people uh, questions to assess their knowledge, and she asked them if bats, um, like what kind of animals they were, a large number of people said they were birds. And what was really interesting was that it had to do with how the word bat is uh, written using the Chinese characters. So, um, it revealed to me at least, not being a native Chinese speaker, in case you couldn't tell, um, that it we don't, sometimes as a social science researcher, you, you may come in and interpret something completely erroneously. So you might go, oh wow, this population, they just, they really don't know anything about bats when really it's um, an aspect of the language, which I guess reinforces a little bit what, was said during the presentation about the importance of involving, you know, people from the community in question in your research. Um, and so when we have, you know, uh, when we do social science research, for instance, in the Philippines, we have local Boholano, you know, people helping us translate. So that goes a long way toward um, figuring out where there's a miscommunication between the interviewer and the interviewee, for instance. Um, yeah, uh, I just thought that was a, an interesting um, point about this question. Um, I, I, this is that was a remarkable uh, myth there that um, Teresa shared with the or misperception. Um, I was wondering if if Ben was still still on the call um, or if he'd had to go yet. Ben, are you still around? Just trying to see because there's some brilliant ones from West Africa. I'm not saying brilliant, but um, the bats don't have um, an anus. Is that right? Oh, I see. Ben, you're there. Are you? Can you unmute and uh, share some of the how perhaps there's anything that you have tried to persuade people perhaps by showing a poo coming out of a bat, um, which is a little harder to do to show that your ears haven't been chopped off. But so this is Iroro replying on oh, Ben's behalf. So you oh okay. Well, I was referring to some of the myths in. Um, in West Africa or Nigeria about bats and how you've gotten how people can counter them. Right. Oof. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how 
exactly that applies to Teresa's question in terms of uh, chopping up ears, like you said, but um, so things like bat pooping from your mouth and uh, bats are just uh, unclean for some people or clean for some other people. Um, but bats pooping from their mouths, you obviously then go ahead to show your field assistants or local assistants that um, they really do not poop from their mouth, they do poop from their um, air hole. So it's, um, <laughs> it, I, I guess things like that, but I, I don't know if that sort of contradicts some of the knowledge uh, comments about how more knowledge doesn't necessarily change perspectives, but some of those types of new information to people may help them. I don't know. Um, but yeah. And we just have a comment from um, Eleanor, who is actually with the KwaZulu Natal Bat Interest Group in South Africa. And she said she usually asks people how many people they know with chewed off ears. And she gets a oh <laughs> question. So she's obviously come across this ear thing too. <laughs> since they so they get chewed off and not uh, cut off by their by their wings that's um i think so i think the the use it's quite hard to prove a negative except as as eleanor had, had valiantly tried there um i think when you can prove a positive by showing somebody i think the thing that aurora pointed out there is the is the power of of changing at least one or two hearts and minds by through this kind of direct link like by showing field assistants who have people drawn from the local community that can be a more effective you know so if, if some people in the local community start start to no longer accept a myth then that's a seed that is more that may have some power to to change the context and change beliefs um then yes i think that that's probably um one piece of emerging thought there that changing it by through the sort of social communication might be one one aspect but i don't i haven't really got an answer for how you prove a negative or disprove a negative and just one um, last couple of questions is um i know that we we've been told you know it's quite difficult sometimes to and the actually is from you know when ewan was mentioning it's really important having kind of local people asking those questions because sometimes looking at trying to get you know public attitudes to certain questions sometimes people will answer what they think you want rather than the true value so what we've actually been trying to do because you know a lot of people say you know that you know everybody hates bats but what we were trying to do is, is to ask some questions in relation to pub, public attitudes to bats and other wildlife because in certain communities they'll just be quite nervous of a lot you know snakes owls lots of of wildlife not just bats and so trying to to look at so initially we were looking at an education program that was bat specific and then we actually thought well actually if the area you know we've got problems with with lots of wildlife you you don't want to you want to look more at a biodiversity angle and um, so just i suppose on how do you you know kind of go about you know, from the review you've done you know making sure that how the questions have been asked that people have answered you know in the way that they feel comfortable but also do you think that i guess like you mentioned you know starting to try and change um attitudes you know with a few individuals but do you think the role of kind of you know very positive environmental education for young people because you know often we hear that you know kids go home and they actually teach their parents and their grandparents and so you know kind of the two, two questions is how do you ask the right questions i suppose and secondly how important do you think environmental education is um, let me start by saying we don't always know how well people have asked the questions because not everybody publishes their um, questionnaire. And so even though we had a high number of quantitative surveys, one of the things that we looked at was, was the questionnaire accessible precisely so that we could, um, or any researcher that would follow them could evaluate whether the questions were uh, whether they could use it themselves, but particularly um, questions like that, because they can be, um, the questions could be leading in many ways. They can be leading in terms of how they're written, but they can, can be leading in terms of what you don't ask, as well as what, which is where you're going with, the, with this, I think. Because an example that comes from Mauritius with the fruit bat uh, conflict over crops that precipitated a massive cull, repeated culls, was that if you, 
go into a fruit farmer and ask him, do bats damage your crop? They say yes. And so you can then leave saying fruit bats, you know, X number of farmers reported fruit, fruit bats damage our crops and they're not happy about it. If you go in with a question and ask what damages your crops, fruit bats are about the fourth or fifth thing on the list after fungus rate wind drop, uh, birds, rats, and then somewhere in the bottom end of that is the fruit bats. So, but unless you've seen the, so first of all, there's the practice itself, as you say, perhaps putting things in context is really key in some of these issues and over focusing on just the bats may, sure people don't like bats, but they don't like anything is what you're saying, or they're scared of everything. Um, and in our case, yes, bats do damage, but not, but actually it's, it's disproportionate proportionate relative to some of the other tax or, or damage losses. So I think that's a very, very important point is that we become so keeping an eye on the big picture, but but also um, I, the, the tendency for people to not accurately report or share their questionnaires. And in some social science um, publications, you're, they don't want the questionnaire as part of the actual submission materials, but that doesn't mean it can't be linked to some other, I mean, there's so many places now where you can archive, whether, whether you hold a personal website or not, but there's many places you could archive your questionnaire for other people to, to use. Um, what was the other one? Environmental education. I don't know. I think this is where from our study we really do need these pre and post i've forgotten the proper acronym that um uh, joanna gave us but we really do need to see whether these work it can i sometimes because i've done exactly this go into the schools because of this theory that they're going to propagate it but also it's easy we go into schools because it's easy all the kids are in the same place you make fun materials they're all really engaged and then the assumption is uh, they will want to retain that knowledge and enthusiasm for bats and, and their hearts and minds will be permanently changed and then that they are spreading this back home. But counter arguments are, well, have we ever actually tested this? Have, have we gone into homes and seen whether people's attitudes are changed by their kids bringing this home? How long does this intervention actually persist for? You do a, a questionnaire before a workshop, kids run around, learn things about bats, you do a questionnaire afterwards, they get all the questions right, you say, job well done, go home. And you know, I've done exactly this, so I'm not casting, <laughs> throwing any stones or casting aspersions at all, but this is what we've tended to do. This is what we got locked into doing. But, but does that actually make more sense than sitting down with the true stakeholders? Um, other counter arguments to the child thing is that children actually don't have much power in the household. So if you're telling people that, uh, if you're working with children to not eat fruit bats, let's say, but perhaps that's what mum is serving or bush meat or whatever the, the behavior is. If the parent is saying, you will bloody well eat that or, you're, or you eat nothing, you know, the child, there is no power in that. There is no power to change the actual behavior by targeting the least powerful people in the entire community. So I don't know if the others want to comment. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, so it also emphasize how important it is to work together with education researchers then as well. So, so just having worked in a, in a, um, a citizen science citizen science project and we worked also together with an education researcher and they were clearly looking also at um, emotions and beliefs because emotions are also somehow linked to knowledge so I just wanted to point out again when we talk about education and that was also something as Tiga said before what we found in the review that the generic recommendations at the end were mostly well we just have to go out there and educate people and everything's going to be not fine, but it was more about let's go out and educate people, but we didn't really know what has worked in this study at what specific parts of the studies might have done something with people. So, so this was one of the, of the parts we wanted to point out in the review as well. And yeah, I just think it would be so important also to work together with education researchers in this aspect when it comes about outreach activities, because they clearly have all the knowledge as well when it comes about um, learning and um, how, how can we process information and what do we have to consider when we 
when we provide all this information because us, as you and said before, we are so excited about our animals. So we go out there and say like, hey, that's so awesome. We have to protect them. But of course, not everybody sees, sees bats as we do, unfortunately, but yeah. Okay, so I think that we've come to, to the end of our questions now. And I just want to say a huge thank you to our speakers. We've had an amazing uh, lineup um, from, from these guys. So a huge thank you very much. And um, we'll look forward to, to really the publication. I mean, certainly across Africa, human uh, bat conflict is a massive issue for us. Um, and we definitely need as much help as possible. So um, this has been really useful for us. And thank you very, very much for your time and incredible knowledge today. Thank you very much for the opportunity yeah. to, to share with everybody. It's yeah. been really, really engaging conversation as well. Very much so. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Really appreciate it.